Hi everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar proposed by uh, Horiba Scientific Teen Film Division. My name is uh, Arnaud Echeverry. I am from uh, CNRS and uh, I speak today about uh, optical characterization of uh, CGS by spectroscopic ellipsometry. It is a common job between uh, my lab, Institut de Boisier de Versailles, Oriba Jobin Yvon from Palaiso, and uh, IRDEP, Institut de Recherche et Développement sur l'énergie photovoltaïque. It's a joint lab um, between uh, EDF and uh, CNRS. Why CIGS? CIGS is a very complex quaternary alloy with copper, indium, gallium, and selenium. The main property of uh, this alloy is uh, that uh, its uh, optical gap is completely related to its chemical composition. The gap is set by the ratio between indium and gallium atoms. So it is a very interesting material because you can change the gap by the composition and also you are able to grow material with a composition gradient and so gradient of gaps. It, it is very interesting for the PV engineering. The main interest also, as expected, is that the gap of this material are well adapted to the solar spectral irradiance, as depicted in the left of the slide. So, in the right, you have a different uh, kind of absorber for PV devices with the progression with the years. And so it is obvious that uh, among the absorber, CIGS is a very efficient absorber for PV devices. Now, commonly, there is a lab cells over 20% of efficiency. The last interesting point of this material is its uh, thin or ultra thin configuration for the conversion. So it is possible to have uh, PV devices that are flexible or classical as depicted in the picture. And for example, here you have solid panel, PV panel on glasses. Why optical characterization by uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry? It's challenging for CIGS. Optical characterization is to provide optical constant of the material. And it is interesting because it is a complex alloy to have methods to characterize the material. Its gap, its quality, local variation of the optical gaps, layer thickness, layer roughness, are properties that are interesting to know, and spectroscopic ellipsometry is able to provide interesting data on that. The second interest, and perhaps also a very important challenge, is the photovoltaic device simulation of uh, the cell using CIGS. You have here an illustration of a paper of Dan Hall, for which using absorption property of the stack, using constants, we are able to, uh, they are able to estimate the device efficiency to discuss absorber engineering and also the PV cell design. 
Why spectroscopic calypsometry is a very interesting method for the optical characterization. Spectroscopic calypsometry allow a range of uh, thin film property to be characterized. SE is able to look at uh, layer thickness to determine the optical constant, the refractive index and the extension coefficient, the very important parameter. Also to determine the optical band gaps, even the thin composition, the interface thicknesses, sometimes the crystallinity, obviously also the grading. Sometimes it is the case for CIGS anisotropy. Also the surface roughness and thickness, and then the uniformity by depth and area. Spectroscopic calypsometry is a very efficient surface sensitive technique. It is non-destructive, non-intrusive, because it is an optical technique. Its principle is simple. There is an incident light, linearly polarized, that reflect on a surface. After the reflection and the interaction with the surface, the reflected light is polarized with elliptic polarization. And uh, in the elliptic polarization property, there is a lot of information about the nature of the material, the nature of the surface. In this picture, there is a nice plain surface. It is important to say now that the quality of the surface is an important parameter for the quality of the quantitative determination of optical constant. This point will be a very important point of this webinar. Why spectroscopic calypsometry of CIGS is so challenging. The first reason is its natural surface roughness. Surface roughness for CIGS is determined by the growth methods. So the empirical rule of D, the roughness, over lambda, the wavelength, close to 0 0.1 is never observed on SAGES. This ratio is all time over 0 0.1 and so it means that the condition to have a good determination of optical constant by spectroscopic calypsometry are not present on SAGES. There is also other difficulty. Surface chemistry, surface alloy stoichiometry variation, and uncontrolled, and also, as I said before, possible compositional gradient due to the quaternary alloy specificity, and so it is difficult to have a perfectly homogeneous material to look by spectroscopic calypsometry. The last point is the rear contact. In the part of the domain, the transparent domain, there is a molybdenum rear surface also that can give rise to perturbation of the optical property of the global system. In this slide you have the first spectroscopic calypsometric picture obtained on roof CIGS samples. You see that for the two parameters, epsometric parameters that are the angle phi and the angle delta, there is very strange value. It is true for the fringe in the transparent domain, but also when you increase, we enter in the absorption domain, you have also very strange value. And so the simple observation of this data, it is evident for people that work in lipsometry that it is very complex to determine exactly what happens 
and it is quasi impossible to have a quantitative description of spectroscopic ellipsometry data if you want to determine, for example, optical characterization by optical parameter. So due to this difficulty, we start a combined project between Oriba and IRVEP to define a strategy for the spectroscopic ellipsometry of CIGS. We try to obtain a diminution of the surface fluorescence, if it is possible, to propose a surface chemical engineering with oxide-free and binary solenoid elimination, also if it's possible, and also to modulate the CIGS layer thicknesses to provide for the spectroscopic uh, ellipsometry experiment different thickness of layers that is very interesting to work linked to determine the optical constant. So all these gold are not the dream and we do that in this collaboration. So we decide to mix several um, experimental approach to perform spectroscopic ellipsometry as good as possible. So the first point is uh, our chemical engineering approach. We used bromine acidic formulation to try to flat and to decay also the thickness of the layer in the left part. Another important point is the chemistry of the surface. So to look for this point, we use x photoelectron spectroscopy to determine how is the surface chemistry. Another interesting point is the morphology of the surface. And to have information about that, we use AFM measurements Another very, very important point is the ungraded layer assumption. And so to look for this point, we use chemical profiling using GDOES experiments. And uh, the profiler is uh, a product of Oriba. And finally, we perform spectroscopic ellipsometry on the Ellipsometer, UV cell 2 from Oriba. We use a large range of wavelengths. We work with angle at 70 degrees. The spot size are 1 mm. And to treat data, we use the Delta Psi 2 software of Oriba. So, obviously, the main results of our work is uh, the decay of the roughness of the sages. Using our formulation with bromine species, we are able, using hydrodynamic assistance and also temperatures, to thin the sages and uh, to obtain control thickness of absorber between 2.5 micrometers to 0 0.2 micrometers as final thickness. So it is a very spectacular flattening of the initial both surface and you see in the left the decay of the RMS value and the picture of this flattening, the quality of this flattening. So we have a strong effect on roughness, and the question is what happens in spectroscopic ellipsometry. So in this slide, it's uh, evident that uh, the roughness elimination induces a complete modification of the spectroscopic ellipsometry response. 
you see with time of etching, so with the decade of the roughness, an evident modification of the response. At T0, it is the initial response, you have a complete anomalous parameters psi and delta. It is very it is impossible to use this data to make a, a quantitative interpretation of the spectroscopic ellipsometry data. As soon as the time of etching increased, typically two minutes, you see that the shape, the global shape of the response completely changed. It is true for the French region, in the transparent region, and also for the absorption part when the light is uh, absorbed in the material. It is interesting to see that after this global modification, the stabilization of the spectroscopic ellipsometry is evident, and so it means that we are now able probably to determine accurately or to use accurately the optical data extracted from the spectroscopy epsometry, so from the direct psi and delta parameters. So we have to make a global comment at this time. For the flat surface, it is okay. But it is sufficient for the D over lambda ratio. It is close to a sufficient value. But after the etching, is it a clean surface without toxin or any superficial film? And are we sure that the sample at the surface and under the surface in the penetration length of the light is commonly without gradient, so ungraded sample. is not so evident for the two last points. So a flat surface without oxide, without composition gradient, is easily observed for indium phosphide, for gallium arsenide, for example, but it is very difficult to demonstrate for CIGS. So we have to do that before give that our spectroscopic ellipsometry, that is clearly ameliorated, is clearer, are clearly objective to a good determination of the constant. What we do? Using our engineering, we look using XPS measurement at the chemical composition of the surface. And we are able to say that using our etching, we have only on the surface a small increase of the selenium on the surface. So you have a very, very thin selenium surface, ultra thin fins. If you put that in cyanide uh, solution, we are able to completely eliminate this point. And so we are able to have quasi hydral surface for spectroscopic ellipsometry. There are flat and there are released from any surface films as selenium or selenium binary compounds or oxides. The last point of uh, the first part of my presentation is about the choice of our sample for spectroscopic ellipsometry. We try to obtain grow specific sample. How we do that? We use a one-step coevaporation process to obtain polycrystalline layers, thin layers. We decide also to grow with a constant thickness, rather constant thickness for all the sample, and we try to grow around 650 nanometers layers. Then we want to obtain 
ungraded sample, constant composition through the layer, without gradient composition that is very classical for this kind of alloys. It means that we want to have, firstly, a CGI ratio, that is ratio between copper over gallium placidium, and we set this ratio around 0 0.9. It is a classical value for PV devices. And we want to have constant value all over the layers of this ratio. The second point is we try also to obtain constant ratio through the layers, constant ratio for the GGI ratio, that is the ratio between gallium over gallium placidium. This ratio set the optical gap of the alloy. And we decide to, to have a good spectral ellipsometric study to have four compositions, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0 0.6. All the layers grow over substrates, classical substrates for PV that are molybdenum molybden, molybden over uh, glass. So the apparatus to do that is uh, in the right part of this picture, and it is a co-evaporator of IRDEP. You have uh, in the middle all the value for the flu, and also for temperatures. And the interest of that is that we are able to provide constant thickness, ungraded sample, and because there are thinner than the classical two micrometer layers, we try um, to obtain la uh, l lower initial roughness. And using these thin layers, it is possible. And we have a very similar approach than the approach done by uh, Fujiwara in Japan. In this picture, we have uh, an illustration of the effect of the thinning of the initial layer of CIGS on the roughness. Using our co-evaporated specific sample, we start on surfaces for which the roughness is moderate. Using uh, AFM, Microscopy, we are able to look at this roughness, and in left part, we have the initial surface with uh, already good roughness, initial good roughness, around 26 nanometers until uh, 40 nanometers. And when we use our etching formulation in aciding bromine, we are able to decay for very short, for very short uh, etching time. We are able to decay this roughness and to reach classically seven to ten nanometers of roughness. This point is very important because, in a previous, in previously in our in a slide, we we show that our thick CIGS layer around 2 micrometer, micro, micrometer or 3 micrometers, we have roughness around 200 nanometers. So it means that for both the sample, for this both sample, the initial roughness is completely different. The last point, the interesting point in this picture is a AFM observation look for the polycrystallinity of our sample. We see the polycrystalline green, the, the green of, 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 poly, of these polycrystals, and it is a random distribution of uh, these small grains. And so we can eliminate a very difficult point that is anisotropy of optical properties of CIGS that are observed for monocrystalline samples. 
And so it will be important in our modeling for the following slides. Now we have to consider information about uh, the lack of uh, gradient. For that, we use a chemical characterization to demonstrate that we have ungraded sample. We try to obtain that, but we have to demonstrate that we obtain that. So we use, in first step, GDOES profiler from Oriba, and we have uh, four profiles for each composition. And we look that in blue, we have the TGI ratio, that is around constant for all the sample. And in uh, red, we have the GGI value, that is also constant for each sample, but which change with the nature of our co-evaporation and the flux. So it means that for us using this, this uh, GD OES uh, profiling, we are able to say we have a rather constant composition for the sample with various value of the GGI ratio, so it means with various gap, optical gap for each of our samples or of our layers. A second very important point is um, that we do on these samples after etching and after chemical preparation I, I present before, you have also perfect composition for the ratio gallium indium and it is obvious in uh, our picture coming from uh, XPS characterization with uh, the gallium 3D and the uh, indium 4D region in the same spectral energy region. And so it is very, very important that we are able to link each profile by GD and each surface of uh, XPS in here, the GGI ratio determined also by XPS. Now we have uh, our second slide with uh, spectroscopic ellipsometric data. After the first one illustrating the effect of the decay of the roughness, we have the first one here obtained using our specific samples. What this picture can say for people for spectroscopic ellipsometry? We have our two parameters, delta and psi, and we have different uh, color for each composition from the left to the right we increase the composition of the GGI ratio and so we see that we have a roughly same behavior in spectroscopic ellipsometry if you look at the delta value you have a first part we have uh, oscillation in the left and we see that the uh, oscillation and the distribution of the oscillation are not exactly the same and the second part in the right is that we have a region where this oscillation presents a clear damping it is a part where the CIGS absorption happened. In the first part, in the last part, CIGS is roughly transparent, so you see the global thickness of the layer, and also the reflect that is reflected by the molybden uh, over 
as a glass substrate. And so we have roughly the same thing if you look at the Psi angle. We see that we have a classical value uh, for, CIG, for CIGS. The intensity of uh, this uh, Psi value are rather good for absymmetry. And again, we have the left part for the oscillation and for the transparent part of the layer. And in the right part, you see that we have a classical monotone observation that is also used for the damping CIGS absorption region. The important point on that is we can look at different sample with the same composition if we have a very good reproducibility of our spectroscopic ellipsometry response. It is a very, very important point that because it is not the case when you work on thick layers, it's very, very difficult to have completely reproducible samples, uh, data. And so in this case, using our thinning and our uh, flattening of sample by our chemical solution formulation, we are able to obtain that. And it is the first important results of this work. A second interesting point observed directly without important assumption on uh, uh, the samples. Here it is uh, down in uh, uh, extinction coefficient. We see that uh, we are able to see clearly the effect of the etching time on the natural initial sample. Increasing the etching time decrease the thickness of the layers observed by spectroscopic ellipsometry. So we see that uh, depending on the time, the fringe in the transparent part change clearly, obviously, and when we reach the damp damping region we have roughly the same value for each value and uh, it is a clear a clear uh, effect that is important to to, uh, to detail so we have a clear detection of the modulation of the thickness using our thinning strategy so the, the, so the interest of that is uh, we are able to provide several thicknesses on the same sample and so it is very interesting for spectroscopic ellipsometry simulation. Now at this time we have um, reproducible spectroscopic ellipsometry data. that depends of uh, which distribution over the photon energy differ from uh, one composition to another. It's difficult to see directly, but it is the case. And also, which are very sensitive to the thickness of the sample. So we have rather flat layers good chemistry we can consider that it, it is clean that uh, we have no uh, oxide of over layer and so we have control thicknesses so the principle pitfall of the spectroscopic ellipsometry on CIGS are eliminated moreover we are sure that if we look on the thickness of the layer, the gradient is con there is no gradient, so there is no gradient of composition. So we are ready, as we do, for example, for gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, to work by spectral ellipsometry on a very good sample, flat, without important overlayer, 
and with composition that is constant all over the probing of the spectral ipsometry in the layer by the penetration length of the light. So it's a good thing to do spectroscopic ipsometry. So we use, in fact, the model that are described here. We have two thicknesses possible, the same chemistry on the top, the same chemistry on the rear interface, and so the same substrate that is molybdenum and glasses. So we can compare over an homogeneous alloy the data of spectroscopic ellipsometry and try to work quantitatively on the determination of our things. The last point we have to consider is about the rear interface. We have to decide if we look, we use only rear interface that is molybdenum layer or molybdenum with molybdenum selenide layer. We will see that it is a question that is open, but is not a big problem for us in this case. Now in this um, slide, we have the strategy for the fitting of uh, experimental results. We have first to define uh, the optical stack we choose to describe optically our sample. So we have uh, three parts. The inner part is the molybdenum substrate. And we describe the molybdenum substrate using uh, experimental data, data that we have previously obtained on uh, desoxidized molybdenum substrates. We look also this substrate using XPS and so on. We don't put uh, on this molybdenum any thin or ultra thin layers of uh, molybdenum selenide because we know that it is very, very, very thin. We tried to, to do that also experimentally before. And so it's not necessary to obtain good fit. And we don't put additional roughness in these inner interfaces because the information about the roughness is already given in our experimental data from molybdenum inject in the model because our initial experimental data are performed exactly on the same substrates as the when the one used for the grow. Over this molybdenum substrate, we have to consider the bulk CIGS, for which we have to try to determine optical constants by the fitting procedure. We know that uh, this layer is ungraded. It means that we have constant X and Y value all over the thickness. Over this bulk layer, we have the outer layer. That is a, a mixed system with voids and CIGS contribution and the contribution of CIGS is considered as the same as the one in the bulk. So it means we have constant X and Y value also in this part. We don't know what are the thickness of the bulk and also the thickness of the outer layer that is probably only the roughness of the layer. And so we consider to uh, modelize the, the roughness that the better things is to use the BEMA model, the classical BEMA model, which consider the classical roughness of the sample, but on perfectly prepared samples. So we have this three-layer 
consideration and configuration. And we try to modelize the more important thing, to modelize the SAGES using a combination of Adashi law, that is classical for the direct band gap samples, semiconductors. We are able to describe the fundamental gap and the first critical point. And after, to look at the critical point of uh, the band structure at higher energy, we use a combination of tolerance oscillator formula. And so we mix both to try to describe completely all over our energy the spectral the spectroscopic ellipsometry data. In the left we have a picture of that. With point of triangles we see in uh, the IS and IC configuration for optical parameters that we have a very good agreement between the uh, point, the triangles and uh, the line, the complete line that are the line that are obtained from our modeling. So you have very good fit with uh, key square that are always low, classically lower than two. And so we have, can consider that using our uh, modeling combination of Adashi and Todd Lawrence formula, we are able to describe clearly all over our spectral range the optical value obtained by the spectroscopic ellipsometry. It is a very important thing that we can say at this time. And it is the result of our strategy to obtain a well-adapted sample for spectroscopic ellipsometry. In this uh, slide, we have the first result obtained using our fitting of uh, the spectroscopic ellipsometry performed on the different layer with different composition. We have several interesting uh, results extracted from this data. The first one, it is uh, the value we try to obtain, is uh, the value of the optical gap. You have uh, in the right a column with uh, E0 and we see that this value change with the composition. And the value we obtain are rather good. And uh, we remark that uh, the value obtained here are very, very close to the one obtained, for example, by uh, absorption. Remember that for absorption, optical absorption, you are only able to obtain the gap value initial optical gap and so we do that and the value we obtain by optical uh, uh, transmission is uh, very very close to the one obtained by spectroscopic ellipsometry so it is a good thing second point of uh, the determination of optical gap is the variation of this optical gap with the composition we see that we have a variation but the more interesting is that this variation is uh, obeyed to uh, a linear relation shape and when when you extrapolate this relation shape to uh, the composition x equal to zero or x equal to one you are able to uh, obtain the value for c i s and c g s that are the ternary alloy of the systems and Again, we have good estimation of the value of the gap. So, using spectroscopic ellipsometry, it is perfectly possible to determine clearly using our Adachi model for the uh, initial transition, we are able to determine clearly and accurately the gap of the material. So, it is very, very important for the characterization of the material, of the layer, and also 
for the modeling of this uh, layer inside PV devices. The second important point is the estimation of the resulting thickness. As we know, we perform etching of the initial layer and this etching flatten the uh, layer. But we have not to determine, because it is a parameter, the value of the final thickness, as presented before. So, the interesting point is that we obtain final value that are in the column L1. So, these values are different, but the initial thickness of the layer is also different slightly different. And when we look at the difference between the initial and the final value, you see that the delta value is rather constant. And so it is what we expect. Because the etching value, the etching process, when you look that with other methods, for example, with dosage of material inside the solution after etching, gives this kind of result, a quasi-constant etching ratio for the different composition. It is not exactly the same, but it's interesting to see that we have something that is roughly the same. The last point also for thicknesses, estimation, is the estimation of the thickness of the outer layer. You see that it is uh, around uh, 4 nanometer, and uh, you remember that it is in good agreement with uh, what we obtain by uh, AFM uh, measurement for the RMS value. It is in exactly in the, same, uh, in the same range. The Earth's estimation is slightly lower, but it is not a uh, big difference. So we have a good agreement also for the estimation of the roughness of our materials. After the etching, so the decay of the roughness is also confirm with our measurement. So, we are able to determine the gap, the roughness, the residual, H, the residual thickness, sorry. And the last point is the determination of another very, very important parameter. It is the absorption coefficient that is deduced from the extension coefficient K. And you have value in the right last column and you see that we have value that are around 10 to 4 and it is this point is interesting we will describe this after but it is interesting to remark that at this time it is a very big question the value of the absorption coefficient because the absorption coefficient is directly related to the penetration length it is the inverse the penetration length of the light inside the material and so it means the, the zone where the electron hole pair are created and so we observe by our methods and our value that they are under 10 to 5 that is generally proposed in, in a lot of paper and uh, we agree also uh, with this low value, you are not alone to, to, to obtain this value. And for example, uh, we, are, we have an interesting discussion, and uh, we observe that we have exactly the same remark than uh, Fujiwara in Japan also, as I mentioned some, uh, some other points uh, about uh, the interest of the, the decay of the roughness before, in a very interesting paper of this group. And so, we observe also the same things. That means that we propose that the exact uh, absorption coefficient is generally lower than the one proposed in the character. So it is uh, the, 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 the last the last point, uh, the last point that, that is very interesting and obtained by uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry. And uh, when use when we use that, it is uh, more uh, it is more interesting. Uh, for modeling, for example, devices. And so, uh, it's interesting to, to make this framework. 
So we continue to uh, describe our results and the extracted information. And you have what the law of the variation of the important parameters that are N and K with the photo energy. You have the different critical points, the first transition, the zone of the first transition after you have also the zone of the E1 transition at the value of uh, energy that are around uh, 3 electron volts. And the strength of our work we propose here is that we have a complete correlation between the chemistry of the material and it is important to point out that it is related to perfectly defined XPS data. Remember that XPS see only the out layer of our material, so the two nanometers at the surface. And so it means that the composition is the same all over the uh, material, all over the layer, at the surface and inside. And so it is important to say that we have a very homogeneous layer and so we are able to say that and to give the data that you have in the left part. And so you see that we have small variation according to the gap variation and here it is for GGI 0 0.1, 0 0.3 and we continue if you look at the following The last interesting point uh, we obtain uh, during uh, this spectroellipsometric fitting is the determination of the critical point. The first one, E0 and E2, and E1, sorry, is obtained using uh, the Adachi model. And the second, E2 and E3, are obtained with uh, the value determined by the first tolerance oscillators. So using that, we are able to give interesting additional feature, optical feature, that are the critical points. The last point we have to uh, discuss about uh, our experimental uh, data and the determination of our uh, spectroscopic electrometry uh, fitting is uh, the extension of uh, the as-ground ultra-thin CIGS layer. It is what we have when uh, you finish our grow processes. We have to characterize this kind of layers. And uh, as I said before, the roughness we have in this material is until important. It is just at the limit of a good surface for a spectroscopic geometry. So, when you look at the direct thin layer we use in this uh, in this work, but it is also the case we can use this kind of uh, layer for ultra thin devices in a CIGS. You have some difficulties, and I try here to to explain what we do on the as grown layer thin ultra thin layer of CIGS. You have the initial roughness that is around. Uh, 26 nanometer. Here we, we present something for the 0.3 composition. And to model this uh, this uh, layer, we will use our dispersion, optical dispersion, even for the bulk, for the material. But now we make a stack of different uh, optical component that is uh, more complex and we add another we, we in fact we, we divide the uh, roughness uh, layer in two parts an inner part and an outer part and so we use exactly the same uh, the same thing as previously for the flatten uh, the, the flatten uh, flatten the uh, layers and so you increase the proportion of voids and we decide that we have two layers with two non uh, 
determine uh, thickness to to uh, obtain the light. and so also for the, the the thickness of the initial wave. So for for doing that, we we make uh, in the first layer uh, ratio that is not uh, fixed between. Uh, 85 uh, percent for CGS and uh, and uh, 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 15 uh, percent for, for for the voids and after we use uh, the classical 50-50 uh, 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 balance between voids and and, and materials uh, at the, the uh, external layer. So we do that and you see that we have the experimental data that are rather different from the one uh, obtained. Uh, for uh, the flattened uh, samples, but if you do that and uh, we put the fit, but with the low with the x and y that are exactly the same as the one determined before on the thin uh, layer at this same composition, we are able to inject this data value inside the model and to obtain again a very good fit of this natural roof moderated of samples. And it is the interest of the work. Now we are able using our uh, experimental standard data determined for thin and uh, specific layer, we are able to inject that inside uh, this kind of layer that are already layer that are put inside devices, photovoltaic devices. And so it is interesting that because we see that the uh, circle room is finished and now we can use our data, standard data, to modelize, to modelize uh, directly small uh, layers, but it is, it is very important result and so we, we demonstrate. So I I finished after with the last one uh, experimental and uh, uh, the experimental uh, values. Now it's time to conclude. I hope that uh, you agree with uh, the fact that uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry is a good tool, even when the layer to characterize are very complex. It is the case for CIGS, but you see that if you make an approach with a good strategy, it is possible to extract relatively good value, optical value, NNK for example, for different composition of the layer and for a large range of wavelengths. We do that for four composition, very characteristic of this complex quaternary alone, and we will put that in the future in the database of the Delta Psi 2 software. For the perspective, the big question is about the roof sample. It is a very complex thing for spectroscopic ellipsometry, but when you see that when we have relatively good data, optical data, it is not impossible to look at more complex roofness of samples. It is true for other material and I think we try to give good information about that on CIGS. Finally, using our NNK database, it is possible now to think that it is possible to work on multilayer model and also on graded composition model that are that we can use in the Delta Psi 2 tool. And so we will do that in the future.